So what we're talking about today is um, is who's the bloke in the room, and it's fathers. Uh, that's right. In the antenatal period, so we synthesise these papers. And there were th there were 388 papers. That's amazing. 388 papers, good quality research or reports that I had been able to code net, code to co key word, so sort of code antenatal. That was a lot to read, believe you me. Uh, they were reports, uh, uh, so, uh, no, so out of this we've written the report, who's the bloke in the room, a big long report, 25,000 words, the executive summary, which is a very good read and easily, easily read, which is also on the website, and then two appendices which are quite detailed and they're for researchers. <coughs> so, the first question is where are the fathers at the time of the birth, and in a sense, who are the fathers? So I'm going to ask you a few questions and see if you can guess. So what percentage of biological parents in the UK are in a couple relationship at the time of the birth? By the time that baby is born, what percentage out of 100, how many out of 100, would say we are a couple. We're either married or living together or we're maybe living separately, but we are definitely a couple and we're planning to raise the child together. What percentage? 85. What do you say? 85. 85, any, uh, any other thoughts? 50, 50. yes, any other thoughts? <laughs> so it's 95%. Is that a surprise? It is, isn't it? You know, it's very common when I, when I have a room like this for people to say, oh, 30%, and I say, well, I don't know where you live. <laughs> but really, um, so we have this perception, don't we, that there are all these single mums out there, right? That these girls went out, shagged somebody on a Saturday night, didn't really know his name, and carried the baby to term. It's a very misogynist view of women, in my view. And also, of course, a very hostile view of men who are seen as in terms of dereliction of duty right from the beginning. So now we know something. We know that 95% of them are in a couple relationship at the time of the birth, self-defined. Of the 5% who aren't, who say, where the mum says, no, no, we're not a couple. Of those, one in five, one in four of the father signs the birth certificate. One in four, this is the not engaged, this is the we are not a couple, 5%. One in four of those dads is still in touch with the baby and the mother, admitted by the mother, nine months down the line. And one in ten attends the birth even. So what we've got is this tiny group of people where the mum says we're not a couple. She may be hiding him. Yes? <laughs> nods here from people who know. <laughs> That's right. She, in some cases, she's hiding him clearly because she thinks it's going to affect her benefits, right? But nevertheless, they're obviously a disengaged and quite difficult group. Uh, but nevertheless, they're very, very small. So it's 95%. What percentage of biological parents jointly register the birth of the baby? They go along there together if they're not married because they have to both go together. If they are married, one can go along with the marriage certificate and register the birth with the other one. What percentage of couples in the UK today, and this is the same in Scotland, it's amazing how consistent these figures are across all four countries of the UK, including Northern Ireland. The figures are pretty much the same. So, what percentage jointly register the birth of the baby together? Any takers? 75. 75, anyone else? 95, anything else? Okay, it's 95. So it's 95 percent. Listen, their biological parents are in a couple of relationship, 95 percent, and that pretty well accords with the 95 percent who jointly register the baby. Right? Makes sense, doesn't it? I was interested to look at some analysis of, of uh, reg birth registration data uh, in England and Wales, which showed that even among teenage mums, this was a few years ago, and teenage mums 
are of course the least likely to be in a stable relationship. Even among teenage parents, 80% jointly register the birth. So what's really happening is that when a girl gets pregnant, if she doesn't think, or even before she gets pregnant, if she thinks she's had sex that might lead to a pregnancy, she takes the morning after pill. If she doesn't anticipate it going to a relationship. So what we are really having in this day and age are very few completely unintentional pregnancies. It doesn't mean they're, not, they're all planned, because often it's very loosely planned. But by the time they're going to take it to turn, most of these women and most of the men too are, are really okay about it. Yes? What percentage of the births are jointly registered to two women? Now, what people say to me in, the, in midwifery, oh, but we, might, we can't use the word father. Oh, no, we can't use the word father, they say. Because, you know, what about all the lesbian mothers? We'd be really upsetting them, okay? Okay, what percentage or what number? Out of a thousand, how many births are registered to two women? Two. Two, two anything else? One. Now, that's not unimportant, don't get me wrong. But it doesn't mean that we don't use the word father. And in fact, what the research shows is in quite a lot of those births, the biological father is a part of it. You know, there are some women who use donor sperm and don't, come, want, don't want the father's involvement at all, but there are also many who, where he's the brother of one of them, or he's uh, another, a gay man, and they're going, you know, so that just because one in a thousand registered to women doesn't mean that, um, <coughs> that there isn't a father around. The final one here is, because then people say to me, oh yes, but that's all right. They, it looks as though they're together, but a lot of these men are not the biological father of the child, they say to me. They say to me, you know, I mean, yes, okay, she's presenting with this guy, the guy's there, but he's not the biological father of the child. Now, if he's not the biological father of the child, this is a marker of huge risk. It is very odd for a woman to be in a relationship, a new relationship by the time of the birth with a man who is not the biological father of her child. Now, I know, I know one who did that, um, who many years ago got pregnant, was all miserable, she married an older man, she's been very happy, and he was not the biological father of the child, and he's raised the child. There are odd cases. But what percentage of women aged 25 percent have over 25, age 25 plus have a new partner at the time of the birth? The answer is negligible, almost none. Teenage mothers, of course, are the most likely, and even then, it's only 2.2 percent. So I take you through this because I want everybody to understand that at the time of the birth, there are almost no single mums, there are almost no absent fathers. And if maternity services are not engaging with the whole family, they are missing a trick. He is there. Okay, what's his impact? Now this is another thing that we would, that I really looked at. The research on this in the UK, I've only done UK research, right? The research on this uh, isn't extensive in the UK, but it's enough to show, to show some of the impact. So, it all starts now um, at conception. You might have read that there's been a bit of a grumble going on about IVF services ruling out giving IVF to women where the father is fat or too or old. <coughs> the NICE guidelines on IVF do not actually say that um, you shouldn't give it if the man's fat or... In fact, the evidence is that if the father is very fat, or the father is very old, the outcome is likely to be less positive with IVF. So if you're trying to ration your, 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 your services, you might well look at that, right? Now, it's not in the NICE guidelines, and that's, what the, that's why there's been a grumble. But the point is, nothing about fathers is in the, in the NICE guidelines. The NICE guidelines, whether they're the antenatal period, the antenatal guidelines, the postnatal guidelines, You'd think they were all virgin births. <laughs> <laughs> so the fact that the father, research on fathers isn't quoted, cited in the guidelines doesn't mean that it's 
than if it were, it would show something, because it would. So smoking. Heavy smoker father at conception, his children are at risk of short stature, obesity, and ADHD. Right, and that's controlling for all other kinds of possible influences. It's very good research. So heavy smoking by a father at the time of conception has a negative, can have a direct negative impact, you know, presumably on the sperm. Uh, there's also stuff about obesity, I'm not going to go into that. During pregnancy, the father as a smoker, expectant mothers are four times more likely to smoke if their partner smokes. They're four times more likely, and they're less likely to quit or cut down if he doesn't quit or cut down. <coughs> the father's influence is the biggest influence. The, the woman's partner, who as we now know, in most, almost all cases, is the father of her child. His impact on her smoking status is massive. Right? Nice guidelines say, when you go, oh dear, when you're going to engage with the mother about smoking, do engage with her partner. They do say that. And let me tell you, we'll come on to this later, almost none of the services do. They actually try to stop her smoking without reference to her partner, without talking about secondhand smoke, without talking to him about his impact on her. Amazing, I have to say. I find it amazing. Diet and exercise. Couples, weights and behaviours are intertwined. You know, if you're going to try to get a mother to eat healthily and not buy chips all the time, you need to also talk to her partner. Yes? Very hard to stick to a diet if the person in the household isn't helping you. Okay, fathers also have a massive impact on mental health, and this is very interesting to me. I only looked at, in this paper, the impact of the father's mental health during the pregnancy. Okay? <coughs> So we're not looking at the impact of the father's mental health after. We're looking at the impact of the father's mental health during the pregnancy. Well, for a start, mental health is interconnected in parent couples. If one is depressed, the other one is at great risk of depression, for example. So it's depression, they often say, in mental health is catching. You know, so, so if we're talking about the mother's mental health, and it's a big issue these days, and very important, um, we should also be thinking about the mental health of her partner, which will also, we should also look at his capacity to support her mental health. Yes, so the father is pivotal in mental health during the pregnancy, both in terms of his own, the impact of his own mental health and his capacity to support or destroy his partner. Right? So a mother's mental health is often bad because there's something going on in the relationship. Right? It's very, very common that the issue is actually the relationship. If we think of mother's mental health as some little separate thing in a bubble floating away, we are not going to get to the bottom of the problem. So here was an interesting piece of research. Depression in expected fathers. Right? So they... They rule out after the birth. They're looking just at this. Depression in expectant fathers is linked with emotional, behavioural and psychiatric problems in their children <coughs> later, up to age seven. <coughs> and that's controlling for, taking account of whether he's still depressed after the birth. So this period, this antenatal period, his depression, his anxiety has never been researched. I think anxiety would be powerful, but it hasn't been researched, so I can't tell you about it. Depression has. Okay, anyone suggest to me why depression in expectant fathers is linked with emotional behaviour and psychiatric problems in their children later on? Any thoughts? It could be genetic. Could be genetic, though depression isn't yeah. depression isn't so strongly heritable. I mean <clears throat> If we were looking at bipolar or some of those, yes. So it's possibly genetic, but it's probably a very small yeah. effect. Okay, so genetic possibility. What else? Toxic stress. That the mm. What? The toxic stress that the mother experiences. Yes. That's right. Okay. The, the stress on the mother. Okay, so it's an indirect effect on the fetus. Yes? 
It's indirect, it's through the mother. That doesn't mean it's not important. Sometimes indirect effects are every bit as important as direct effects. And we rule them out and go, oh, it's only an indirect effect. So, expectant father's depression is associated with couple conflict. So they're fighting more with un his unemployment, putting them under financial stress, uh, and with money and housing difficulties. So they're just some, those are just some of the things where we have the actual research, right? So we can infer, as you suggest, and I think rightly, that it's the stress on the mother caused by the father's poor mental health. Uh, and I'll just say that father's poor mental health postnatally, which I haven't um, gone into in any great depth, but I will just observe, it has these, continues to have these indirect effects, but it also has direct effects in terms of the way he interacts with the infant. Yeah, so there we go. Violence. The other thing that, that's very interesting in... Time is all right. Um, <coughs> violence in pregnancy is one of absolutely the worst things, right? Because it, it not only puts the mother at risk, it puts the unborn child at risk, and it's horrific, okay? And when uh, one of the ministers in England and Wales was in the Department of Work, what it does with work, wanted to bring in something which we all have, and Scottish fathers too have now, which is a right to two... Uh, days uh, to, to attend two antenatal appointments. It's unpaid, but he has a right to take it. It's a statutory right. The minister concerned rang the Department of Health and said, look, we are about to bring this in. We want to have fathers to have the right to attend two antenatal appointments. He said, um, how about the Department of Health put out a policy where you're going to invite him to one of these appointments? Right? Not all of them. And to invite him to an appointment. To which the person from the Department of Health said, but what if he's violent? To which the other minister said, if he's violent, don't you want to meet him? <laughs> yes? So, what percentage of pregnant women in the UK report <coughs> domestic violence during pregnancy? I have looked into this data till I am completely sick of it. And I cannot find anything higher than 3 to 4%. I cannot. And that's including, that's where you ask the woman, do you feel frightened of your partner? It covers such things as, as verbal abuse, yes? And not just hitting, yes? That's the highest I can find. And so what, and why this is terribly important is the maternity services have this idea that most of the women walking through their door are being beaten up by their partners at home. And I think we have to get real. This is not the case, nor is it the case in Australia. You know, in developed countries, that's about the top figure you can get. That's a very deprived area. That's Hull. That's Hull. I, in other areas, at 1.8%, even less than that. I mention that because I think that's a big issue. I think a big barrier to engaging with fathers in antenatal or at any time is this belief that most of these men are violent. Okay? Some of these men, a very few number of these men, are seriously violent. Okay? But it's not this huge disease that's sweeping the country. Now, Scotland and policy. Do you know, Scotland has the most advanced policy in the, in, in, of all the four nations in antenatal. Its 2011 framework for maternity care actually requires maternity services to recognise the father's role and include them. Doesn't even say the father or woman's partner, right? which is, I would say, father or woman's partner. I think you have to allow for the fact that not all women are in a relationship with the, with the baby's father. Most of them are, but some aren't. So the framework said it required maternity service to recognise the father's role and include them. It also required NHS boards to evidence that this is occurring. Now you will all know, you can put out a policy, nice policy proposal, but unless you're going to evidence it and monitor it, it will be meaningless. I don't think it's ever been ev evidenced or monitored, but there it is. More recently, <coughs> in 2017, the Forward Plan for Maternity Care in Scotland, it's the most recent piece of policy, calls for maternity care to be woman-focused and family-centred. 
I love that phrase. It completely allows for the fact that the woman is giving birth. It's got to be woman focused and the recognition that the baby is born into a family, <coughs> yes? And family-centered will, of course, primarily and mostly include the father of the child. It may include other members of the family too. So the Ford Plan for Maternity Care calls for maternity care to be woman-focused and family-centered. And it says, fathers, partners, and other family members are to be actively encouraged and supported to become an integral part of all aspects of maternal and newborn care. Now you can see that if that were happening, how amazing that would be. Because it would mean educating the whole family, not just the mum. It would mean looking at breastfeeding. We know the, the greatest impact on the, on the mother's breastfeeding rate is, is her partner, in 95% of cases, the father of her child, who is there at three in the clock, clock in the morning when her nipples are cracked and she's crying. And he says, shall I go out and get a bottle? Or she says, oh, shall I, can, shall I go on with this? And he said, well, it's up to you. Yes? That man his, has enormous power to say, let's get someone, let's contact the breastfeeding counsellor. I, I got a number from the health visitor. Just let's stick it through tonight and see what we can do. And I'm with you all the way. Yeah. So... We did a little survey, and this was amazingly helpful. Oh, God, I have so much to say. <laughs> so little time. This was done with Father's Network Scotland. We put out a, a very short survey, survey called How Was It For You? And it was directed and that you had to be eligible to answer us online. You had to be, have had a, a baby within the National Health Service in the UK within the last five years, and that baby had to be your first baby. So it was first time fathers in the UK, National Health Service, last five years. As what always happens is that the respondents were better educated fathers than the average. Yes, that always happens when you do something like this. However, that was quite good because we know from other research that the maternal, that midwives and people are much nicer to middle class dads. The ones they ignore and pass over are the disadvantaged fathers and the working class dads. I mean, the, the evidence is so clear, it is quite shocking. So what we're getting from these dads is as good as it gets overall, right? These are the most more weighted towards the middle class fathers. Um, so and we know that because 97 percent 0.7% were cohabiting with their baby's mother, where the figure nationally is 85%. Right? So although 95% say they're a couple, 85% are cohabiting. So this is weighted. So we know that. We haven't therefore run the figures. We're just giving them to you bald, and we're saying, folks, this is as good as it gets. How many first-time Scottish fathers attend at least one routine antenatal appointment. Give us a guess. Please. <coughs> one routine one. This is where they're taking the mother's blood and, you know, we're not talking about the smart things like the scalp. What percentage of these guys are showing up at the hospital and sitting beside her? And this is the Scottish thing. What? About 90%. She says about 90%. Anyone else? 100. 100. It's actually, this is 92.2, .2, right? <coughs> at least one anti. So any the maternity service that tells to me, oh, we don't see the dads, I will say, what? <clears throat> They're there in the maternity. What, so what percentage attend, attend this, at least one scan? <clears throat> Firstly, 100, 99%, yes. And what percentage are, are present at the birth? 97%, yes. This is the first time fathers. Now, overall, it would be less. If we had the less advantaged fathers, it, it'll be down to about like 92% of the birth, you know. It's not down to 70%. They're almost all there. They're in maternity services. If they wanted to engage with them, they could. During antenatal appointments, did staff ever talk to you about your relationship as a couple? 25%. You're smoking. Aha. Uh -huh. 51%. Remember, the key has the most powerful impact on the mother's smoking. And even then, and in this group where they're likely to look at him and ask his name and speak to him, 
51. Your alcohol intake, 44%. Your physical health, 25%. Only one in four of the fathers were even addressed in terms of their physical health during the, uh, by the maternity service. And your mental health were even less, 16%. During the antenatal appointments, did the staff at least sometimes speak to you directly? 71% said yes. But 29% said no. Never. Never addressed. Did they address you by name? 50%. Encourage you to ask questions or raise concerns? 70%. Speak about the father's role? 39%. Right? So quite a lot of them are engaging with some of these better educated fathers, but there's an also a big gap here, and, and we need to be concerned. Okay, so we have recommendations. <clears throat> all this is on our website, and if you want to take this further and think about it, of course, it's all there. So our first recommendation is to change the NHS terminology to refer to fathers. So we could say father, stroke, woman's partner. Right? That is inclusive. I suggested this to Nice, and Nice said, oh, that would be, what did they use the term? That, that would discriminate, be discriminatory to say father. I said, this, we put it for not only I, but you know, father, stroke, woman's partner. How is that discriminatory? To which there was no reply except, well, it is. The term woman's partner or mother's partner defines the baby's father solely as a support person, right? If she's his, the woman's partner, um, and does not recognise his unique connections, both genetic and social, to his infant. Yes, because these fathers are in a unique position, as also is the woman's partner, who may be, you know, in a few cases, the lesbian partner. She's far more than just a support person. You know, she is actually going to co-raise the child. Recommendation two. We we'll go back to that phone call that the minister made from the Department of Work, Employment to the Department of Health and said, can't we invite him? With the mother say so, of course. You don't just go inviting him. You say to the mother, we'd like to invite your partner to one of these appointments with you. That's if he's not already there, because in many cases he's actually sitting in the room, right? Um, how, how do you feel about that? If she says, no, I don't want him, of course. You know, it starts with mother. Of course it does. It's a maternity services. But how about, issuing an, how about issuing an invitation to one? So we see that he, he knows right there and then that he's important. If we're not interested in him, if we don't even have a chair in the room, or if the chair's over there, which it often is, mother and the midwife are here, oh, there's a chair for dad over there. Yes. So this defines him as, as unimportant, as, well, as irrelevant, really. Recommendation three is to deliver services of woman-focused and family-centered, right? To deliver them, as you know, is already required in um, Scottish policy. For this to happen, we have to father-proof maternity staff training. I mean, I'm, I'm called in to give a lecture, you know, here and there on fathers. Oh, King's College Hospital said, will you come in and do our undergraduates, do a lecture on fathers? Nothing. Nothing in the competencies says they need to uh, engage with both the whole family. They're not expected to, there's nothing on it, nothing on the father's role, the father's impact. So we need to father-proof that. We also need to father-proof information by expecting the new parents. Now, Gary does that very well up here. Where's Gary? Where's Dad too? Father-proofing your work. Yes, it's Gary Clapton, right? He's very good on this. He's at, up at the University of Edinburgh. And what he means? in the room. And in the room. Where is he? <laughs> Gary, you're a star. I use your work all the time. Yes, yeah, so what he does here, and I do hope you all read it, is to look at the very obvious things. Where's the dad in the picture? Is the dad, you know, marginal in the background, not there at all, represented as threatening? Does the word father appear anywhere in the document? Um, and our final recommendation is to collect better data on expectant and new dads. 
Growing up in Scotland has been pretty dreadful on this, I have to say. It's not been very good. And um, any future birth cohort study, when we start to you know, talk to families, uh, should collect data in pregnancy from both the father, woman's partner, and, and the mother. We should start with the father so that we really know there's nothing in this country where there's no piece of data in the whole of the four countries of the UK which has ever asked fathers, did you intend the pregnancy? Was the pregnancy intended by you? When we say a pregnancy was planned, it's all on mother's data. So that's a very interesting question because an unintended pregnancy does have negative impacts and we really don't have the data on that. So there's much that we could ask. And with that I will finish. And thank you very much for listening. <laughs>